I awoke in this beautiful tunnel of white, golden, silvery luminescence. And it felt as if I was in this state of you know, energy is the best word, but it just felt like a, a, like a wind, like a very soft breeze. And it was this energy that was flowing around me and through me. And it felt like it was me. I'm very happy to have Zach Tavkar with me today. Zach, thank you for being my guest. Thank you for having me on, Tia. I appreciate it. We're going to have some fun today. We are going to have some fun. I'm <laughs> really looking forward to this. You had a near-death experience when you were just a baby. To me, 14 years old is a baby. Tell me about what happened. So what happened was I had just um, got out of my first two months of chemotherapy treatment. I had been diagnosed with leukemia in August of uh, 2001, late August 2001. And I had had stayed in the hospital for a month. And uh, as soon as I got out of the hospital for that first month of treatment, I had developed an infection. I had a Broviac chest catheter that had got infected, had a blood clot on it. So I went back into the hospital, um, had to get that removed, that catheter removed, and then had to get an angioplasty to have that blood clot removed in my subclavian vein. So that was another month in the hospital. And I was also on a medication, it's called prednisone. And so prednisone has a lot of side effects, especially when it's long term use. And I was on it pretty much every day for a month to almost two months, really. And my vertebrae, the L234, my lumbar vertebrae had fractured and collapsed. And so when I got out of the hospital, um, I was having back pain and they said, okay, we're going to, you know, they did that everything found that I had the fractures and said, we need to get you fitted for a back brace. You need to wear a back brace for six weeks so that your vertebrae heal and you're not, you know, hunched and slumped over. And so begins our story. So that day when I was going to get my back brace fitted with my dad and my little four-year-old brother at the time, I had to get blood work done and I didn't eat anything that day. I needed to fast. So I got the blood work done. Uh, they took quite a bit of blood work, and then we just headed right over to the little office, little technician office, where they were going to take my measurements and do this back brace fitting. So we walk in, my dad, my little brother, and I, and as we walk in, I started to feel a little fuzzy-headed, and I had known that feeling prior because I had passed out a handful of times already from the time I would, had been diagnosed until that point. So in the last two months, I had probably passed out three to five times. So I knew that feeling of fuzziness and I knew that I needed to eat some food. However, I was 14 and was trying to tough it out. And so all I had to do was stand there on these kind of like parallel bars, much like the Olympics that we're about to watch, but you know, the parallel bars. So I'm just holding you know, myself up. My dad and the technician were friends from uh, the music scene in Reno where we're from. And we're just chit-chatting and talking. And as he was taking my measurements and dimensions and all that, and they were chit-chatting, I started to feel a bit fuzzier. So, you know, getting a little tingly, you're starting to feel like weaker. And I was like, okay, I can, I can make this. I just need to, you know, tough it out and then I'll get to the car. So that took about 30 minutes of all the measurements and all that. By the time that the measurements had been finished, I started feeling very fuzzy. Like the, the tunnel started to close in on me. And so I kind of rushed out the office. You know, we said our goodbyes, rushed out the office. My dad was trailing behind just, you know, you know saying, oh, come, you know, come to my, my show next time. My brother's hand in hand with him. And I'm about 40 yards ahead of them, just walking down the road, trying to get to my dad's truck. So as I'm walking, the tunnel just keeps, you know, fading in on me, fading in on me. And I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. So I get to my dad's truck and I sit on the little edge not the lit, not the full bed, but the, the little lip where you can step up to get into his bed. And I get on my elbows and my dad is about 30 to 40 meters away from me with my brother right around the corner in the parking lot. And I, I just looked at him and said, dad, I'm going to pass. And then I just passed out. And when I passed out, I awoke in this beautiful tunnel of white, golden silvery luminescence and it felt as if i was in this state of 
you know, energy is the best word, but it just felt like a, a, like a wind, like a very soft breeze. And it was this energy that was flowing around me and through me. And it felt like it was me. And so I was just kind of enamored with this space of, I don't know, just purity, you know, just pure love. It felt like pure liquid love that was just flowing around and through me. And then I looked forward and I saw this silhouette of a man in a trench coat or a day coat, as I've come to know it. And my first thought was, oh, that's Grandpa Joe. That was my dad's dad who had died seven years previously when I was just seven. And so I was like, whoa, I couldn't see his face. I couldn't make out his characters, but I knew that that was who, who it was. And so as I started looking deeper, it was my grandpa, but it was like a much younger version of him. I didn't know him. He died when he was 80. So the oldest I had known him was from when I was seven, when he was 73. So he was not a young man anymore. And so we had this inaudible conversation. A lot of it, I do not remember. And I don't know if my, if I'm not allowed to remember it just yet, <laughs> but what I do remember is that he told me that everything was going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. You just have to keep going. And that was something that just, you know, really said, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. You just have to, you just have to keep going. And so we kept having this conversation and I'm just kind of enamored in this space. And it felt like it lasted for forever. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I was just sucked right back out of the tunnel or out of this like tunnel. It was weird and into my body but my body was completely numb like my nervous system was still offline it was it was just i couldn't move but i could hear and i heard my dad saying zach 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 you okay zach wake up zach are, are you all right are you all right and then i heard a second voice say is he okay do you want me to call 911 you want me to call the cops and my dad just said no 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 he's i think he just passed out blah 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 and so as he's saying that, I finally am able to like the, the tingles are just kind of tingle in my mouth. And I said, I'm okay. I just can't really move. And so then maybe 30 seconds passes and the ner my nervous system starts coming online and the tingly start to happen all over, like little ants are calling all over me. And then I was able to wake up. And so I opened my eyes 30 seconds to you know 45 seconds later. And my dad is like, panicked my little four-year-old brother is right over his shoulder because he's kneeling my dad's kneeling my brother's standing freaked out their faces are panicked and then this other man who was just a bystander that didn't even know who he was but he had saw it, he seen it happen so he ran over and then i my dad got in my dad's truck very slowly you know eased myself up helped, got help and then we went to the healthiest uh food option possible we went and got some mcdonald's breakfast and <laughs> And, uh, and that was it. So then I, I, you know, in my mind, I'm 14 years old. I had not had an experience like that at that time. So I was thinking, okay, I just made that up. I'm hallucinating something, you know, trying to, trying to, um, I don't know, figure it out myself. And then I finally was like, you know what, I'm just going to tell my dad. So that was, you know, a week or two later. And I said, Hey dad, I, I don't want to freak you out or anything, but, um, when I passed out in the parking lot, I saw Grandpa Joe and immediately his response was like, oh, my God, is he are you OK? Like, is anything wrong? Or, you know, are, are, are you going to like, is anything bad going to happen? And I said, no, I, you know, I was in this tunnel, but I I. I saw Grandpa Joe and he said, all I can remember is him saying everything's going to be OK. You're going to be all right. You just have to keep going. And uh, I told him that I saw him in a trench coat. And so about a month later, two months later, he, he brings me a, a picture and he said, you know, is this what Grandpa Joe looked like? And it was a picture of my grandpa at 30 years old in Prague with a, the same exact length day coat. So that was kind of confirmation to my mind, and, you know, my psyche, my, my conscious mind that that was in fact a real experience. I didn't make that up and I'd never seen that picture before for sure. That was hidden in the deep in the, you know, the, the picture, the picture files of my parents. And, uh, and yeah, that was my experience fun. Well, the other thing is that my dad had magically, 
uh, turned into Usain Bolt. And as I was falling, he actually caught me before my head hit the ground. So my near-death experience was more of like a near-death out-of-body experience where I did not die, but I did have this very uh, transformative uh, ethereal experience. And confirming as well with the picture, yeah. which yeah. is really, you know, a lot of people can't do that. They don't have confirmation yeah. of their experience. Not yeah. to say that their experience isn't real, but to have that confirmation is just even more validating. And it sounds like your dad um, received your experience well. Yeah, he he's pretty. Uh, my grandma, his mom, was very spiritual. She was she was you know Catholic, but she was also very spiritual and very open to all of that stuff. And my mom's very open to all that stuff. And so I think just having that openness uh, helped him accept that that was part of it. And it's weird that I it took me many years actually. It probably took me till I was about twenty two to really accept that experience. In all honesty, like it. Maybe maybe a little earlier, maybe 21. But I started meditating at 19 on a daily basis and had crazy, you know, um, out of body experiences with that. So maybe that helped. But it, it, I think it took took me till about 21 to fully accept that experience. My conscious mind was just having a really hard time um, logically explaining that. But I just thought, you know what, that was my experience, and I just have to accept that it is what it was. I can't imagine for a 14 year old to have such an intense experience and then just go about life like it, you know, never happened. Did yeah, you have yeah. a spiritual or a religious background to kind of lean on? We were uh, like uh, holiday Catholics. I, I, I always found myself very interested in mystical experiences since I was the earliest time I can remember, like very interested in in um, angels and ghosts even. And, you know, my favorite show, which scared the hell out of me, but I still liked watching it was Unsolved Mysteries, you know, where there's all these mystical and different experiences in, involved in there. And I couldn't wait to see like an angel or, you know, a, a spiritual, you know, uh, experience that somebody had. So I'd always found myself very interested in that stuff. I just, um, we didn't really have a seriously religious background. My grandma, my dad's mom, who I mentioned, she was by far the most spiritual and was very involved in self-help seminars and Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra and Tony Robbins, you know, early on in the 90s and the 80s. So she was very interested in that stuff. But that was that was it. I just had her kind of as like this spiritual mentor, if you will. A lot of people that have had near death experiences, they've come back and they have miraculous healings. Um, and obviously you've been healed. Do you attribute your near death experience to play a part in your healing? Yes, only in the sense that it wasn't it wasn't a direct healing like you would say from like Anita Morjani, I think she was the one that had cancer and then had the near death experience and then came back. Uh, that was not my experience because I not only did I have from October I had uh, five more you know I, I had treatment until May, so seven more months of treatment of chemotherapy. Uh, but then I relapsed when I was 16. So I, I relapsed when I was 16 and then had to go through a whole nother, I had to go through a bone marrow transplant at that time. That was a, that, that was a totally, an, a whole nother story. But then I, I wasn't cured until I was 21 really, but I was in, I don't know I, what that did for me rather than, um, cure me physically was it, I think it opened up something in my mind, something in my brain. Well, my mind and my brain are different, but something in my brain to where I could I could hear a little voice. I, I would call it in my book that I'm currently editing on the second draft. But it's it's this little voice that I could hear when in times of severe struggle or stress, um, tri trials, going through my treatments, uh, that I could hear this little voice and feel this emotion associated with it, and that's what that's what happened. So it it opened a gateway for me to where I could then not heal myself, but use the, you, 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 yeah, use the skills that we are all endowed with to heal, to allow that healing to, to happen. So that was more of my, my experience. It was like kind of a, just open the gateway, turned on the switch, whatever you want to call it, open the door so that now 
I can be a clear channel for that um, essence, presence, spirit. That's a beautiful gift. So you are able to access kind of the other side, then you have a maybe a tear in the veil that you can go through? Yes, particularly personally. So I can, I can, ex I can um, now, and it's taken a lot of years of practice as well, like meditation and stuff like that, uh, that's opened it even further. But I can hear um, when I'm in times of like deep, deep uh, questioning, uh, I can hear answers. Sometimes I can, I can channel, like I channeled my grandma when she died, which was kind of weird. I've channeled a few people, friends that have died earlier than expected and given messages. So I can do that. It's just not a skill I'm like super endowed with, but I can hear and feel guidance much easier, I think, than most people can um, and recognize that that's guidance coming from my inner being, my higher self, my soul, my God, whatever, you know, God source. Is your grandpa there? Uh, I haven't talked to my grandpa ever since that experience. Yeah, I've talked to my grandma a lot, but uh, my grandpa, I don't think I had as much of a, uh, an established relationship with him. So I'm just more familiar with my grandma's um, energetic signature, if you will. And I think that that relationship is just closer in this life. So it helps me in this life. So why do you think it was him that came and delivered that message to you that everything was going to be okay? I, I'm assuming and I'm pretty sure it's just because he was the closest relational person at that time that had died. And um, it was a good it was a good way for my conscious mind to understand that uh, I did have that experience. Whereas if I had seen like a, a spiritual guide or somebody like that, that I didn't, I wasn't able to recognize or, or know at that time, I think I would have had an even further difficult time accepting that situation. And when you were in this place, did it feel familiar? To me, it felt more in alignment um, than this reality. So it felt as if I, that was the place that I'm we're all from right that space but I didn't even get to pass the tunnel like usually some people you know you make it past the tunnel and then you're you really feel it but that energy that that love that liquid love that felt more refreshing and more um, fulfilling and more home-like than than anything I've felt up to that point until I started um understanding that that was just something I could bring back with me, that that's part of this earthly reality. So it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like any more real or different, it, or, or any more real than each other. If you get to the space um, where you understand that that already is present here, it's just about learning how to recognize it. And you said that you're able now to access the healing gifts and that's kind of how you healed but everybody has access to these gifts. Can you tell me more about that? The, he, the healing is a response. Healing is always a response of allowing. And allowing is a state of, um, uh, you know you're in allowing when you feel good emotionally. So the emotions, and this is all like Abraham Hicks talk, but it's been confirmed many times through hypnosis sessions. I've done about 100 quantum healing hypnosis sessions with people and every everybody's higher self says the same thing. And my higher self and my counsel that I had when I was under hypnosis from another practitioner uh, confirmed all this, but the allowing state like well being is our natural state. So healing is our natural state. Health is our natural state. We often like unless you're born with some really you know debilitating illness, which unfortunately, like we don't want to hear that. And it's hard to accept. But most times, actually all times, when a child is born with these problems, difficulties, they chose that before coming into body, right? And it's hard to accept because like, why would you, why would you choose such a horrible existence? And, and it's, it's, that's the answer that we're just going to have to kind of leave open-ended as a wonder. Like, we're not going to have that answer. You're not going to know. But for the most part, realistically, that, that person, is, that child chose that experience to expand, to grow, and and to relieve some of whatever they felt they needed to. Like nobody forced, nobody thrust this upon them. They chose it. 
so that he, like not in re, not in regards to that and even that those situations can be healed off that's that's the that's the law that's the that's what that's what the law is the healing is the recognition of that the health the wellness is already present that the soul is already healed and doing the things in in our body so thinking the thoughts taking action changing our beliefs through our thinking so that we recognize that that is already there for us and aligning with that so really it's a visualization state and if you're feeling like my example if you're feeling like you are let's I, i'll do my example right now my lungs i've been dealing with some lung tension and tightness that's why we had to reschedule this right so this lung tension and tightness and so it's very maddening when i'm trying to breathe in and i can't get a full breath it's very frustrating it's very difficult but then knowing that that's a perfect indication that i'm resisting something in this space right there's some resistance here to where i can't get that full breath in could it be related to the covid that i had 6 weeks ago or 7 weeks ago absolutely could it be related to the 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 problems that i've had with my immune system after i had covid 3 years ago absolutely but the body is still trying to tell me something it showed up in hives and rash a month ago those went away and then as soon as those went away boom i got this lung tension and so what i did with that is instead of being so mad like so mad and angry and frustrated that things were happening to me again i did do that i did and i went through that but then i said okay i'm going to look for these moments of relief that i've got meaning that moments where i'm feeling a deep breath and i'm going to induce a state of gratitude and i'm going to say i'm grateful that i just got that deep breath in i'm so grateful that this presence within me is helping me get a deep breath in so that i feel full that i feel expansive and then we go inward when we have those sense that that little sense of relief we focus on the gratitude focus we know that the body is healing itself and ask that little area of the body what are you telling me what are you telling me and you just have to still yourself and quiet down and so it's this game of acknowledging what is all right i'm having a physical dis uh, problem i acknowledge what is i know that it's happening i'm not going to run from it and then not only do i acknowledge that it's happening right in this moment this is all i've got right now i ask what it's telling me and then i go from that space and i try to kind of understand that that's happening when i acknowledge what's happening and then i ask what's happening usually you'll get a little relief right you you'll get this answer you go okay i can see that that's happening and then you say to yourself right you use your little affirmation okay i'm going to go forward and i'm going to recognize when i'm doing that when i'm not letting life in right like air would be like letting life in i'm not letting life in i'm not feeling i'm not enjoying life i'm stressing myself out with x or i'm focused on y you know i'm focused on these areas of my life that is causing me to disallow that well-being to flow and causing some resistance and that's just like that it's just my thoughts and then my favorite is working on your faith because you have to trust that there is this spirit there is this inner being there is this higher self there is this energy source that is within you at all times and that wants the best for you and is working on your cells at all time there is when we die the that energy source is lifted right and that's why the cells no longer function the brain stops the heart stops all that stuff so recognizing that there is this this intelligence this this soul self within you and you just have to work on your faith with that right trust that that is working with you you're moving forward together but it sucks in this reality because it's slow reality is slow and it's there's a delay a time delay from when we want the manifestation to show up when we want the health when we want the healing to when the healing and the health show up and it's just it it primarily relates to our resistance it's we're focused so much on the discomfort i right how can you not focus on pain when you have pain how can you not focus on sadness when you are sad right how can you not stop thinking about that person that you're missing when they're gone how can you not stop thinking 
about the chest tightness when you're trying to breathe and you can't get a breath in, right? All of these things, that's valid, right? We, are, we all do that all day long. And the game and the task is to remove our attention from what is happening, acknowledge that it's happening because that's your present. That's our present moment right now. Oh, your lungs feel tight. That's your present. Okay. What is it telling you? It's telling you there's still some resistance, but are you doing what you know you need to be doing? You know, you're, you're doing the work. You've acknowledged the problem. You, you're, you're let, let, you know, you've, you, you, or the sadness, you've acknowledged that. And you're like, okay, I'm going to go forward today in this moment. And I'm going to look for things to appreciate. I'm going to go forward. And when I find moments of relief, when I find moments of, 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 of finding peace, you know, the, the, the joint doesn't hurt. Thank you, joint, for not, you know, I, I'm so grateful when you feel well. You know, the rash or the hives or that you have skin disorders. I'm so grateful that my skin looks so good today, or at least it feels good today. Or even acknowledging in other parts of your body, I'm so grateful that this joint feels so good. So bringing the, yourself up vibrationally into that state of allowing to where that, that energy can easily flow. And then going, saying, and this is the tricky part because we can't see it. We can only feel it. Inner being, source, God, I know that you are with me and I know that you are taking care of me and I'm going to trust that what I'm asking for is flowing into my experience as swiftly as I can allow it. And then that's it. That's the game. So that's what I learned from a lot of years after that experience. And it's always, it's always I'm here now and <laughs> I get symptoms and I get problems, but they all they all resolve themselves. And that's a lot to learn. And there's so much in there that I want to kind of digest a little bit more. I think trust is one of the things that comes up in almost every near death experience story is learning how to trust, trust that the universe wants the very best for us and is advocating for us kind of like on every level. And you talked about that being the tricky part. How can we trust better it starts with your mind it starts with the thoughts that you're thinking that's what it comes down to it starts with taking i have so many different quotes that i have in <laughs> I, you, I have just a list of quotes that i read on a daily basis and it helps me remember that i'm not the only one that is going through struggles and that people, these great people that have experienced you know, certain hardships, Mother Teresa said, I know God wouldn't give me th anything I can't handle. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. <laughs> like Mother Teresa, this, you know, and all that, you know, Martin Luther King, you don't have to see the whole stairs case. You just have to take the first step in faith. Like there's all these quotes, but that's, that's just little thing. It's people throughout history who have attained certain heights or states, certain states of being who we, who, who we revere heavily all have had these difficulties. You're not alone in your difficulties. You're, you're very human and you're supposed to have them and they're part of your experience and that's a good thing. But it's a, it's a mental game and that's why our minds are so powerful. Like you have to make your choice and you have to choose when you find you have to be aware of your thoughts, that's part of why meditation is so important. Recognizing and being aware of the thoughts we're thinking. And then when things are, when, when we start spiraling downward, you know, because that's easy to spiral down, well, downward, recognizing and stopping yourself and going, I'm just going to give myself 20 seconds to breathe, take my foot off the gas. I'm not even going to put on the brake. I'm going to take my foot off the gas. And I'm going to breathe and I'm just going to feel my, my heart. And I'm just going to breathe. Right. And that's enough to stop that momentum. It's going to really slow it, the breathing, the meditation. And then once you've stopped that momentum, choose a thought that feels better. So then say, no, I'm going to try, I'm going to do my best to try to have faith and I'm going to do my best. And I'm going to say, oh man, you know what? I was telling myself that story because it was just a story I was telling myself. And you know what? My hip does hurt today, but my knee feels really good. I'm really grateful that my knee feels good. 
or, you know, you may not even get to gratitude, but I really like when my knee feels good, or I really like when I have a good job. I really like that I make money. I really like that I have a bed that I can sleep in. If you don't have a bed that you can sleep in, I really like that I have breath that I can take that keeps me alive. I really like that my heart keeps pumping. I really like, you know, playing that game until you start elevating yourself. And then with practice, that becomes a habit. So giving yourself, that's the hard, it's a hard one for me. It's very hard. I was just telling my wife, I'm like, I hate having patience. I hate it. And I think we all have that same feeling. It's we want the manifestation now. I know what I want clearly, right? I know what I want clearly. I've had these, these negative experiences, these situations, these encounters with people, this, this, this health problem of missing somebody, right? I know, I know what I don't want. Therefore, I know what I really do want. I'm clear with what I'm wanting. Why isn't this showing up? And the reason it's not showing up is we're just holding some resistance still. And there is a time gap from the time that we understand that manifestation until it's going to show up. It's just like planting a seed in fertile, fertile, fertile soil. Life is fertile soil. You planted the seed. As soon as, you, as, soon as I, my, I knew my lungs felt tight and restricted, I knew that I wanted big, huge, powerful breaths in where I'd always feel full of energy and full of life. But it took me time. I planted that seed in the soil. I was watering that soil because I kept asking, right? I'm watering it, but I wasn't having faith. And so I was covering it from getting light. So the light that's going to you know, really energize that, that seed and that soil is the faith is the trust, is the belief. And that's practice. That takes so much time. And it takes, it took me years. I remember learning about the law of attraction when I was 19 and having these conversations with myself and so, and just saying, why can I not develop faith? Like, why do I have such a hard time with faith? And why can't I trust that things are going to work out for me? Like I was 19 at that time. I, I was working finally. I was a valet parker in Reno, one of the hotels. And I was so excited about learning that I had control over my life. But I missed the part that I needed to have trust in the universe. I needed to have trust, but I didn't have trust because I'd just gone through five years of not only me suffering, but watching kids die, watching their parents suffer, you know, like watching. <laughs> well, that made me emotional. Um, wow, I didn't, well, sorry. Uh, yeah. And I was angry. I was mad. And I didn't feel uh, looked after, even though my parents and my family were amazing. I didn't feel looked after and I didn't feel supported by God. And I was pissed off. And it probably still hold on to some of that. And that's the scar that I'm just going to have to carry with me. And maybe it's still a wound. But it's hard, you know, faith is hard. But we just have to keep working on it, even when we have those scars, you know, and go, that's part of me. And we walk around with scars all day long, <clears throat> all day long. But you still have to make a choice that those scars aren't going to direct your experience and you don't have to keep pointing at them going look at my scars you just walk forward going this is this is who i am now and i'm going to shine through these scars anyways you know i'm going to let them heal so that's that that's that i think that you're a perfect example here of 
the gratitude that you're talking about where everything doesn't have to be perfect for you to be grateful for something for you to be grateful for a lot of things and how can you not be emotional when you went through what you went through and you've seen what you've seen but yet you still choose to be grateful for the things that you do have instead of angry and upset and there may be some angry and upset in there but you're not focused on that you're focused on the things that are good the things that you're grateful for the things that you feel bring value to your life yeah I also love how the the things that bring value to your life you're talking about are sometimes the distressing things the the difficulty with your breathing you called that a gift and that's a beautiful way to look at even the hardships of life because we do shift and change through those absolutely yeah they, they're what does Rumi say? Uh, pain is often, within pain is often hidden mercy or let these pains be your messengers, you know, light is, or the wound is where the light enters you. That's it. You know, like that's, it's pain is, it's a gift because it brings you to a state of, of questioning and that questioning, a lot of people don't have that deep depth of questioning. And when you have that depth of questioning, you're going to deepen your well of what is potentially offered to you, right? If you're just digging on the surface, <clears throat> your pond is going to be so small, right? That knowledge, that water is going to be so tiny. But when you have real severe suffering and you're struggling, you're, de you're digging deep. Why is this happening? Why is this going on? What the hell is happening? And what's going to happen is when it rains, you're going to have, right? That clear water is going to be filling you so deeply and then you just keep asking and asking and asking and you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper until your well is full of, of wisdom of knowledge <clears throat> and of abundance right you've got all this water people are going to come to you i need some water i would i'm thirsty come this way i'm thirsty right i i'm i'm thirsting for knowledge i'm thirsting for understanding and you have asked these you know questions and you've You've deepened your well of wisdom, of, 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 of abundance in all areas of your life, not just financial, but relationally and health. And then you become, you, you get to play, I, I, I use this analogy and people don't like it, but you get to play the game of life knowing the rules. Like you really do, you understand, oh man, that I, I'm, I'm creating my experience and it's happening right here right? Only you can see the world through your eyes. But then you are allowing the universe, God, that source, that infinite intelligence to bring all those things that you're wanting into your life, because you know, oh, the ticket is always gratitude. The ticket is acknowledging that I've got pain, that I'm hurting emotionally, physically, whatever. But I wouldn't be be given this gift if I wasn't ready to receive the answers, right? If I wasn't, if I wasn't ready to open it and see what's in there for me. So that's me going off on a tangent, I think. No, I love that tangent. <laughs> it's a, a beautiful way of looking at the struggles that we go through. Um, so have you learned to live differently? I mean, you were 14 years old when you had this experience. And it took some time for you to integrate it. Did it start your 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 life? Did it change immediately, or did it take some time? It took some time. It took time to integrate that, particularly because I was so focused on just getting better from being sick. You know, when you're in the midst of a struggle like that, people probably watching this right now are going through chemotherapy, radiation. It sucks. It's it's. The app. So that's probably my biggest fear right now is, is relapsing. Every time something happens, my brain goes, oh, shit, did I relapse? Is something else coming up? Oh, am I having side effects from the radiation? Am I having side effects from the chemo again? Am I having, fuck, you know, these latent side effects that are showing up? It took time to integrate that. I think I, I always, my mom is incredibly, she's like a little light bulb. She's got her own issues, but she's always very positive. And um, 
my dad is very funny but he's kind of like the shadow he's like the she's like the light and he's like she's he's kind of like a little bit of the darkness and she's the, the light and so my mom was uh, incredibly uh she helped me have the outlook that i have and then having my grandma my dad's very positive too but he can get a little dark but i think just integrating the lessons that they taught me and helping me have that that mindset but then when I was 19, starting to meditate and coming out of everything, I, I really had a lot of questions. I wasn't in the struggle anymore. So I was like, okay, why did all this happen? And immediately I was just given just bang, 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 book, book, in, insight, insight, book, book, insight, insight, you know, all of these just, it just exploded my brain. And that's when I was able to live truly differently and start working on particularly like the faith the gratitude, even though I was already pretty up, upbeat and positive and happy person, it really helped to understand how that affected my healing when I was sick and why I made it through. You know, always having that end goal, end aim that I was going to make it and I was going to be here doing these interviews with people like wonderful Tia and sharing and writing my book and doing my YouTube channel. And, and even if I only helped 10 people at a time, it was 10 people worth it. Like that experience was worth it because that 10 people is going to turn into another 10 people from them. And then they're going to share it. And then it's, it just takes one candle to light a thousand others. Right. And it's, and that's, that's how I, I want to live my, I live, I choose to live my life that way. Now, like I'm going to light as many candles, even if people think I'm a crazy weirdo for talking about the stuff that I do and a lot of people do I'm going to to share my experience and light a candle and even if I just light one candle then that candle will light two candles and then they'll light another one and you know like that's so I just yeah I live my life that way now but it took time it took probably until I was about 19 to integrate that once I got out of the real hard stuff and was able to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs <laughs> Once I was not struggling with that base level of just trying to, to live my life, I was able to move upwards and, 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 and ask those questions and be like, okay, I'm okay now and I'm going to get some answers. And then I'm going to get these answers and I'm going to take those with me. Another quote I like is, uh, knowing is not enough or no. Willing is not enough, you must do. Knowing is not enough, you must apply. So I am in the state of constantly trying to apply what I know. And that took till about 19. That's a great quote to go along with the law of attraction. Cause I think there's a misunderstanding sometimes where you just have to will things to happen. And that's mm -hmm. not the, the entire picture. Um, you talked a little bit about why this happened to you. Do you think it was, a gift one to help you heal you learn this great healing modality i guess you could call it a modality yeah. um process anyway process, and then yeah. now you're sharing it with the world so i do you feel like it was on purpose i know it was on purpose not i had these insights beforehand but when i went and started doing um quantum healing hypnosis as a practitioner <clears throat> and then had I was, I was curious and, you know, with, with the other people's experience, but then I wanted to be hypnotized myself. So I did, and I got hypnotized twice, once because I wanted to, and the second one because I was reached out to by a practitioner and we just traded. And both times was confirmation from my higher self that the reason I didn't need to, I didn't need to have cancer. It wasn't required, but it was very, it was a very high likelihood. And that was because I needed to be on a specific path that I had chosen to be doing this stuff. And if I got off path, that was going to throw me right onto the path. And it was going to ensure that I went down this road. And so I obviously got off path because you get human and you forget what you're supposed to be doing and what you're here for. And 
you start becoming more egoic, right? Especially at that age, as a 14 year old boy, you got testosterone and you're a good looking kid and you're athletic, you're gonna be, you're gonna be very egoic. And that thrust me onto this path of inward seeking <clears throat> rather than outward achievement. And uh, outward achievement is good, but the inward seeking must come first. And so that was confirmation in both of those that I needed to be on this path, sharing, gaining this insight, right? Remembering these things, because we already know these, our soul already knows these things. It's just about remembering them, but you have to do the work to remember them because the brain is going, the ego is, the mind is going to try to thrust you into physical reality or, oh, play this physical reality game, play this physical reality game. But you have to play the inward game first so that you can be a really good player of the outward reality game. And uh, yeah, so that's, I know for sure that I was, I, I had to experience that because I was disconnected. I was off path. Tell me how my viewers can reach out to you if they're interested in finding out more about your experience or if they wanted, if they had questions for you. Yeah. I have been putting a lot of content out on YouTube, so you can just look up my name, Zach Tavkar, on YouTube. I have plenty of um, videos there that I do every, I do a video every three days, so I release a video every three days now. That's my goal and my aim, and I will continue with that, and I love people's comments because sometimes people say, I just want to learn more about this, and I go, great, I'll do a video about it for you. Um, so I do that. My website is my name, www.zachtavkar.com. Um, my primary job, you'll see, is an exercise physiologist, a personal trainer. So I have my own business doing that. Um, I also do life coaching. And uh, primarily, people always go, I want to, you know, what do you do with life coaching? And I go, oh, well, I focus on this. It's a spirituality based, um, utilizing the law of attraction um, teachings and processes um, to, to, to bring those things forward into your life and to allow those things in, into your life. With, relationships, money, health. And then I also do the quantum healing hypnosis, but that's primarily only in Reno because I don't like doing, on, doing them online. And I think that's it. I'm pretty, pretty active on those like social media, Instagram or Facebook, but pretty, pretty very active on, on YouTube. And, uh, and yeah, those are my, and then I have a book that I hopefully will publish in the next year. I'm still editing it. The second edit, it's a little tricky going through all those things, but yeah, that book will be coming out in the next year, hopefully. And if you had one message that you wanted my audience to take away from our conversation today, what would it be? Hmm. I hate this question because I have so many. <laughs> I know, uh, there's a lot. Rewatch this video a thousand times. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if, I had to, if I had to give somebody one suggestion, or like one message, it would be just, just breathe, know that you're here now and um, try to connect, con not try, but connect with your, with yourself inwardly, you know, breathe and connect inwardly with that, that your heart, you can call it, but that spirit within you, that's that's supporting you, that's keeping this body animated and alive and active. And love, love yourself and start there and then you can love others. You know, breathe, be still, connect and love. Cheesy, cheesy, but I think that's, that's what we have to do. I think it's really important though. And loving yourself is something not enough people do. It's hard. It's hard to love yourself, but recognize that your higher self, your soul, sees you as pure perfection. There's nothing you need to change or be or do differently. You are beautiful. You are perfect. You're worthy. You know, you are worthy. And it takes time to acknowledge that within ourselves, but you're seen that way at all times. I've never heard an inner being say that somebody wasn't worthy or beautiful or perfect exactly as they are. And you can change if you decide to change. That's beautiful too. You're supposed to change, but you're beautiful. You're perfect. You're worthy. You're seen as that. So just breathe, be still, connect with that place within you. And then you can love yourself and you can love others. 
Zach, thank you so much for being my guest. I'm so glad that you were able to heal, that you had this experience and that you're yeah. sharing it with the world and for all of the beautiful things that you do for, for everyone. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you for having me and thank you for pr producing these interviews and these wonderful, this wonderful content that can bring these things to, to everyone else for sharing your gift. Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.